This webinar will be exploring some of the intersections between science and art and how it can be used to convey uh, certain meanings and certain ideas. And yeah, the product of the integration and diversity of these disciplines, um, it's, of, it's, of, it's of interest for, um, I guess, in the modern world overall, because we need to improve scientific communication and education uh, in order to solve some of the issues that we have in our, in our society. So uh, welcome guys again, and um, we're gonna get started with the event. Thank you very much, Oscar, and welcome you all, our students, volunteers, and everyone that's uh, here in this webinar with us. As Oscar just said, this is one of our series of webinars that Science Fab International will be giving. This one will be particularly in English, the others will be in other languages. So in order to begin, let us introduce our first uh, panelist. It's Dr. Janet Iwasa. She is an assistant professor of biochemistry at the University of Utah. After receiving her PhD from UCSF for her work completed in Dyke Mullins lab, she completed a postdoc with Jack Sostak in MGH Harvard. And later she worked on biological visualizations as a faculty member at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Iwasa, we're really happy to have you here. If you could please turn on your video and can start with your talk. Thank you very much. Uh, so I can't share my video because uh, it says the host has stopped it, but I can. I think I can still share my screen. Um, so yeah, let me know if I, yeah, I can't start the video, but all right. So I'll just get started anyway. Um, so yeah, it's a real pleasure to be here and, and talk to you a little bit about my work. Uh, so when people ask me what I do, I usually say that I'm a molecular animator. And so what that means is that, you know, um, I basically spend a lot of time in front of a computer, uh, but instead of animating things like, you know, fish and like superheroes or something, I animate molecules. Um, and so some people might wonder like, why, why is this something that people do? Um, so just at, by means of an introduction to scale, which, you know, so I don't know how, what the background is of, of people who might be watching, but um, this is a, an interactive from a website, uh, the Genetic Science Learning Center, which has some really great uh, visualizations. But here you can see, we're starting with some recognizable things. So we started with a coffee bean and now we're zooming in. So this gives you a sense of how small molecules are. So we're see, still seeing some things that are relative, relatively recognizable. So we have a bacteria, um, we're getting into stuff that's inside the cell. Um, and now you can start seeing some things that are really um, beginning to be under the, the wavelength of light. So things that are really invisible um, using, using even the best light microscopes. Um, and molecules are coming up here. So we see some proteins, um, some RNAs, things like that, that we can start seeing here. So this, this gives you a sense of scale of how small these molecules are. Um, so in terms of how I got into animation, so I was in grad school when I first got interested in doing animation. Um, and, and the reasoning for that was largely because of the way that, that things are visualized in biology. Um, so in, in generally, when you look at like a biology textbook, or if you go to a biology talk, you see depictions like this. So you have a protein that's, you know, being shown as like, you know, a triangle and some circles walking along a line. And so this is a really interesting protein. It's, it's called kinesin. And it was a protein that was being studied by a lab right next to mine when I was in grad school. Um, and so, so basically, you know, I saw a lot of presentations uh, that people were doing research on, on proteins like this and, and showing these types of figures. And, you know, like after you see a lot of these talks, you're like, yeah, that makes sense. You know, like the, you know, I, I think I understand how kinesin works. It kind of, you know, walks along um, these microtubules on this kind of line. 
Um, and then what happened was that the head of this lab, his name's Ron Vale, he decided uh, after they solved a structure of kinesin to hire an animator uh, to create an animation um, of kinesin. So that's shown here. So the animator's name is Graham Johnson. And this was really the first molecular animation I had ever really seen. Um, and so this shows kinesin um, walking along a microtubule using all of this data that, that they had gotten, um, not just structural data. So what does the protein look like and what's its shape, but also information about um, its dynamics. How does it move? What, how does it um, bind to other proteins? Um, how does it um, use energy to take these steps? Um, so I think this really brought the protein alive for me in a way that nothing else really had. And so at this point, I, I became super interested in trying to think about whether I could learn how to do animation um, and, and, and really apply it towards the type of things that we were studying. So that was, that was really kind of what um, got me really interested in animation. And so I, I learned how to do animation in grad school. And as a postdoc, um, so after my step after grad school, as a postdoctoral fellow, um, I pursued animation. And so I'll, I'll show you a few examples of these animations. So one process that I animated at this point quite a long time ago, almost 10 years ago, is this process called clothrin-mediated endocytosis. And this is not the animation. Um, so this is just uh, showing you a figure of what endocytosis is. And so what's this gray thing is supposed to be a cell. Um, and you have proteins that are at the surface that have to be internalized. And so they get internalized in this kind of membrane bubble um, called a vesicle. And so that's basically the process of endocytosis. So now I'll go ahead and show you the animation. Um, so basically what's happening here is we're looking at the surface of the cell and now we're looking inside. Um, and inside of the cell, we have these green proteins that can bind to clathrin. So clathrin are these three-legged proteins there. They are called triskelions. Um, and they basically can self-assemble into these regular lattices that can provide the energy required to bend the membrane. Um, and what you see here is now proteins on the surface of the cell are getting captured inside this growing vesicle. Um, and we have uh, basically adapter proteins that are also getting caught in here. So coming up in purple here are proteins that basically cut the membrane. So they can bind to the, to the membrane and, and cause fission. So cut, cutting the membrane between uh, the, the cell and the vesicle um, is shown here. And then what happens next is we, the vesicle is basically done being formed. Um, and so we have this disassembly process where uh, basically clathrin needs to be taken off of the vesicle. And so we have proteins that are binding in here. So we have an orange protein that binds to part of clathrin as well as part of the vesicle. Um, and then a second protein in yellow that binds to part of this orange protein as well as part of clathrin. Um, and it binds it in a specific way that causes all of the clathrins to kind of twist around a little bit. And that basically loosens up these connections and allows clathrin to disassemble um, and basically fall away from the vesicle. So this is a relatively um, old animation at this point, um, but I pointed out partially because it was, it was really uh, an important one in my career and thinking about how animations could be helpful for scientists as well as for scientific communication. Um, so if we go back to this figure, this kind of more typical like textbook figure, um, I think you know there are a lot of things that are missing from this. There are a lot of things that when you look at this this really simplistic figure, we don't we don't necessarily ask questions about space and time, um, and also you don't get the sense of like why why would a scientist be interested in spending his life trying to understand um, endocytosis. When you watch, look at something like this, you don't get a sense of that complexity. And so um, having visualizations that really reflect how scientists think about a process um, really, I think, um, is really important for scientific communication as well as for scientific research. So Tom Kirkhausen, who I made this animation with and um, has been a really great collaborator. Um, and so as a scientist, he says that molecular 3D animations inform both the scientist who creates them and the audience that views them through an active process leading to further inquiry and discovery. So, you know, this is, these animations are really great 
for teaching and communication and outreach, but they're also really useful for researchers to kind of wrap their heads around these really kind of complex um, and, and dynamic um, kind of problems. So, you know, just a kind of a quick note here that, you know, one of the things that I, I really love about what I do is that you get to sort of imagine you I work with a lot of uh, different molecular biologists and think about a lot of different things. Um, and, you know, and I basically the process is is really trying to understand this movie that plays in their head, you know, so if you're a researcher who's been studying a process for for years and maybe decades, you have this this movie in your head of how things work. Um, and, and my job, I think, of is basically trying to understand what this movie is and make it into a real movie that they can then show. Um, and so that, that has been a really super fun thing. I've got, gotten to learn about all sorts of uh, biology through it, and it's been, it's been, a really, um, it's been a really cool job. So one of our um, current projects is actually animating SARS-CoV-2. Um, and so this animation focuses basically on how the virus is able to get into cells. Um, and so this, this first part just shows the basic anatomy of the virus, the different parts of the virus, including um, the inside, which shows where the RNA is. Um, and so then we basically have the virus here that's approaching a respiratory epithelial cell. So these cells that are lining your respiratory tract in your, in your trachea and your lungs. Um, and so that's shown on the bottom, this cell. And the viruses are able to bind. So the viruses have these proteins on their surface that are shown in teal that are called spike proteins. And they bind to these purple proteins called ACE2 on the respiratory cell. Um, and what happens after this binding event occurs is that additional proteins that are shown in orange that are proteases, basically they cut um, the spike protein in, in various places. And this basically um, kind of exposes a part of the spike protein that wasn't available before. For. And this causes spike protein to undergo these major shape changes. So it injects itself into the membrane of the cell, and then it undergoes these, these conformational changes, these shape changes that then allow the membrane of the virus and the cell to fuse. Um, and, and this allows then the, the kind of the, the RNA to enter the cell and to really begin that infection process. Um, so this has been a really, you know, so we're, we're actually animating the entire life cycle. Uh, this is just the first part. Uh, so the next parts will show basically what happens inside the cell. So if you're interested in seeing that, I'll be posting them on Twitter. So please, you know, um, if you are interested in that, please follow me on Twitter and, and I'll be posting those publicly. Publicly, we're making these um, available uh, for, for different audiences. Um, so I wanted to show one more animation to show kind of the diversity of things, but um, I actually forgot to sh share the sound. So I'm going to share my screen again and turn on the sound so I can I can share this because this has some narration to it. Um, all right, so I, I don't only animate molecules. Uh, so although that's been my, our major focus, uh, so I just wanted to share this last animation to give you kind of an idea of the types of things we do. So this is an animation about dust. Um, so that might be kind of something that's that's fairly familiar to everybody. Dust bunnies. They are in our homes, accumulating under our sofas and beds. But what exactly are they? Where do they come from? And what are they doing? We know dust matters to human health, but not all dust is the same. Research suggests that while some kinds of dust are linked with increased allergies and asthma, others can actually help prevent allergies and asthma. Still others may be linked to antibiotic resistance. So what makes these kinds of dust different? Dust bunnies are complex and include matter from both inside and outside the home, such as hair and skin from people and pets, insect remains, fiber from clothes or furniture, and bits of dirt. Dust is also home to a wide variety of microbes, like bacteria, fungi, and viruses, that come from both human and non-human sources. These microbial communities are surrounded by lots of different chemicals. These chemicals include antimicrobials in our soaps, plasticizers in our bottles, and flame retardants in our furniture and building materials. Basically, dust bunnies are ecosystems shaped by factors including who is around and what they're doing. Wets and dust can also be affected by whether windows are open or closed, and by what kinds of products we bring into our homes. Every day we make choices that can affect what's in our dust. So what kind of dust is in your home? 
All right. Um, so that's it for my presentation. Um, so yeah, it's I'd be happy to take questions. I think I think at the end um, is the way we're doing it. Thank you very much, Professor Iwasa. So sorry for the inconvenience. I think we have solved it now. And yes, we will take questions in, in the end after all the panelists have presented also. So please, if you have questions, uh, everyone that's attending, please uh, be aware. You can also put them on the chat. So in the end, we can do them to the panelists. Thank you very much, Professor Iwasa. And now uh, our second panelist of the day is Professor uh, Anabel Romero Hernandez. Maybe if you can turn on your video and your audio. So as an introduction for Professor uh, uh, Annabel Romero, it's originally from Mexico City. She got her PhD in structural biology and graduated from Cold Springs Harbor Laboratory in New York. Her day job is finding new structures of proteins that are helpful to treat many kinds of diseases at the Regeneron Pharmaceuticals Company. When she's not solving structures, she likes to illustrate different scientific and cultural topics to communicate science to the general public at Opuntia Visual. So very welcome. We are glad to have you here. And please, you can start your talk. Thank you very much for joining us here today. Thank you guys for inviting me. And it's great to be among uh, great speakers. Uh, it was really nice to hear to uh, Dr. Iwasa. I've been a fan of your work for a while since I'm a structural biologist. And I'm also looking forward to listening to uh, Sun Yu Chen. So I'm going to start sharing my screen. Um, so you guys can see a little presentation of some of the stuff that I do. Uh, and you can let me know when you can see it. Uh, so I hope you can see my screen now. And as I said, well, my name is Anabel Romero Hernandez. I see that some of you in the panels uh, uh, speak Spanish, so but I'm going to be focusing in this talk in English. So a little outline of uh, this uh, small presentation is I'm going to tell you uh, who am I? Uh, and then uh, an approach that I've been thinking of uh, illustrating to communicate science is to always think about who's your audience. Is it going to be the scientific community when you need accuracy and details? Is it going to be the general public where we actually need to get rid of some of these details to avoid distraction and get the message across? Or is it going to be kids, which also we need to approach it in a more friendly way? So just to tell you about a little bit about me, I was born and raised in Mexico City. Uh, I got my uh, degree in biochemical engineering at the Politecnico Nacional. Then I did a master's in molecular biology and slowly I became interested in studying um, sort of like understanding how things work. And uh, just like Dr. Iwasa was mentioning, I'm uh, passionate about uh, all the, the things that involve proteins. And that's why I decided to pursue a PhD in structural biology at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. Uh, currently, my day job is to analyze how these proteins, like the spike protein that you were just looking now in the previous animations, how do they interact with drugs like monoclonal antibodies that you probably heard uh, everywhere. So understanding how those interactions are and how um, they actually can affect our targets. How do they develop? What can do better? That's what I do every day. But uh, when I'm not doing that, I actually uh, created a website, a blog. I have Instagram. If you uh, have your phone around and if you're on your computer, I put a QR code where you can take a look at my uh, at all, some of my work and uh, some of the stuff I've done. But I'm going to show you uh, some of it. So to talk about who's your audience. So I was saying some of them, it can be the scientific community. And you can see here, for example, I have a uh, representation of what is actually uh, a protein. This is a particular protein that it, uh, it's expressed in the brain. It's called NMDA receptor, since it's just one part of it. This is part of what I did during my PhD. But I wanted to take a instead of just doing the representations normally using all the software, I wanted to give it sort of like a more um, artistic vibe. And what I did was to actually draw it by hand using all the coordinates that I had from the actual structure and do this representation that actually reminds me of uh, Jeanette um, Richardson, who was the person that did the first representation like this 
uh, sort of like ribbons that you see that you may have seen in some textbooks and that's actually thanks to her. So I did something like this and I'll show you in a little bit uh, a couple of things. Another thing it's something for the general uh, public right something that it's more visually attractive in this case you see this sort of like DNA shape and it has some plants. But it lacks a lot of details of information like in the other one and last, for example, for children, this is just a depiction of the stomach and you can see there some uh, two little guys that are just like destroying everything that it's the pepsin so it's supposed to be like these cook guys and in, at the bottom are the nutrients so it's a little story that i developed so i'll talk, talk more about it so if we talk about developing for scientific community uh, community we're normally used to seeing in articles here's an example of um, one paper that i got during my phd is to see all these um illustrations made in uh, software that's specific for structural biology, et cetera, et cetera. But at the end, we like to do some suggestions of based on our experiments, what do we think it is? Uh, what's the mechanism of action? That's the, the key uh, sort of like everyday question of a structural biologist. And normally uh, we use software like Photoshop or Illustrator to do um, proper images. But what I wanted to do was to give it a twist. And instead of doing my representation of what a mechanism of action was doing this, I actually did it using watercolors. So as you can see in this image, it has a complete uh, different look. It still conveys the same information. It tells you how this protein actually moves when you have the sink and how the channel could be opening. That's what sort of like what we were uh, depicting. And then that uh, uh, structure that I was showing you previously, that is the one that I saw. There's still images in the paper that actually depicted in the software. Normally, uh, you can use a software called Pymol. That's the most common one to visualize these proteins. But I wanted to give it something different the, to make the message across that you can put a little bit of uh, artistry into your science. But you still have to be very accurate. You have to make sure that what you're depicting, it actually corresponds to what you're trying to describe in the paper, for example. So that's one way to uh, use illustration. Another way is what I was mentioning for the general public. Uh, here's an example that I did because these two techniques that you're seeing here, X-ray crystallography and cryo-electron microscopy are techniques that I use every day to solve uh, protein structures. And I wanted to make it in a way, it's always, if you can explain the work you do to your mom and dad, to your uncle, to your grandma or grandpa, then uh, you're training yourself not only as a science communicator, but you're also learning uh, more about it your, uh, yourself by repeating it to other people. So I try to make it really simple. You can see how you can go in the case of cryo-electron microscopy, something when you have a sample and you freeze it and you visualize it and you get a protein structure. There's a lot of details that I'm missing here that, um, Normally, if I were to make this uh, for the scientific community, I will have to give more detail. But this is just to introduce people to the topic. Another one is this recent one that I did about uh, Mexico and the diversity that we have of native plants, right? We know there's a lot of plants that are native to Mexico and that are used in the culinary uh, Mexican, cu um, Mexican cuisine. And I wanted to bring that together. So this is an example when you can not only bring uh, science because all what you see listed are the scientific names and noting which plants are actually native to Mexico. But on top of that, all of the plants that you see here are actually edible, which brings this um, for people that probably are from Mexico or are interested in Mexican cuisine will bring will be able to introduce them to a little bit of science. So you try to um, reach to a broader audience by, by bringing a little bit of culture. And the same thing with this other illustration that I did before that you see the shape of a DNA and what it depicts here, it's all the plants that have been fully um, sequences. Their genomes are fully sequenced. And you even see in the image, the, the genome versions of them. So it's, it's a lot of information and this comes from the Phytosome website that you can access, everybody can access, but if you have it in one single image, then somebody that doesn't have a background in science can appreciate the effort that's being put on on plant science, for example. 
uh, not only I've been doing this in a sense of in English, which is mostly what I've been doing, but I also want to bring this in Spanish. I know we are uh, fortunately in English, there's a ton of information for uh, lots of scientific topics and the scientific community is a little bit more open. But in case of uh, in, in Spanish, there's a little bit of lack of it. Like, for example, this illustration that you see here of the circulatory uh, human system, it's something I just did for fun. I didn't expect it, but if you actually Google Sistema Circulatorio Humano in Spanish, then this is one of the image that comes up um, more frequently, not in English. I did this as well in English, but it doesn't come up as often because there's a lot of information. There's a lot of material that you can use for science communication in English, but not so much, not so much in Spanish. So I think there's an opportunity um, for people that can speak more than one language to bring this together and try to work with them, make it bilingual, so you can actually uh, reach even a bigger audience. So this is one of them. And then this is another one that I actually did about structural color. I have this um, little infographic, both in English and Spanish. And the one that I did in Spanish, actually uh, it was uh, it showed in the Butterfly Conservatory in the uh, zoo in Mexico City. If you, uh, if you have been to Mexico City, you know about the, um, Sioux of Chapultepec, and they have this butterfly conservatory. So whenever they have the season for the um, blue morpho, they will have this infographic there. So I thought this is a great way to uh, talk to people in other languages, in this particular case, Spanish, since it's my mother tongue, and communicate science as well. And uh, so then this is sort of like bringing everything together and if you see all of these images, for example, if you see here the butterfly, uh, it's, it's, it's all made using watercolors. There's a lot of images of how the scales of a butterfly look. And instead of just taking um, an image that comes from a microscope or something like that, which is the most common thing, I wanted to represent that with drawings which gives it a little bit a twist. Same thing as what I was mentioning to you into the scientific community, where you actually get to see this in a little bit uh, uh, sort of like a friendlier way. And I've noticed that uh, people that are not science related at all may take it a little bit um, easier, right? It's, an, it's a more friendly way to communicate and it also it's great for uh, educating kids. And into that aspect, actually, for children, I've been doing something, uh, I have a couple of projects that I've done. One of them is this one, um, where for the whole month of October, I did uh, something that was related to science. So you can see like either uh, E. coli, a bacterial phage, something. And if you can tell in the illustrations, they all have like cute eyes and make it friendly so you can actually see them and they look cute and you like them. But at the end in the little booklet that you see in the in the side, um, it's not only that, but it's also telling you, oh, what is it? If there's a plan, uh, what is what is specific about that? What's the scientific name if, if it needs it or if it's a tool like a micro pet, what's the use of it? So you can uh, start having kids being interested in science in a friendly way. Another project that I did also science related was a bird diary that was to create a little journal. I did this together with the BioBus, um, which is located here in New York and they have a lot of science programs for kids. And what we did was to create this little um, books where they, the kids could learn how to have a scientific mind and, uh, and start taking their own notes. So the whole idea was that with this uh, little booklets, you can see here we have, this is one of the activities we actually have. They use the booklet and they learn how to have scientific observations. We went outside, check out, um, learn if they're looking for birds, what do they have to look for? And you see it's each of them are used in a different way. And lastly, uh, also I created um, some, um, you can see here about the digestive system. So it's something really basic. This is basically for uh, for kids. And the whole idea is to create, was to create a little sort of like 
movie. It wasn't animated. It was more like storytelling, like when you tell little kids in a book. And the story was about the nutrients, which are those three little circles that you see in green, blue, and yellow that had like a little hat and, and glasses. So to give them personality and how do they travel um, across uh, the digestive system all the way from the mouth. So they were located in the mouth when they reach the stomach, who do they need? They're floating in the hydrochloric acid and how do they travel along? What happens in the pancreas? And you see adding this sort of more like friendly faces, you can actually uh, get a different approach where even little kids of like, four or five year olds can actually start being introduced to science and create a little bit more. So that's sort of like what I have and I'm open to questions, but I think that's gonna be happening at the end. So I'm gonna be stop sharing now. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Annabelle. So we have some questions in a questions and answers uh, spot. So maybe you can you can answer to them directly. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the questions was we, uh, what the Instagram pages you can follow in order to become an illustrator as, a, as an example. But thank you very much for your participation. We're really glad we're looking at incredible illustrations from different from the different panelists. And now we're gonna move along. Our next, uh, our next guest is Professor, <clears throat> sorry, our next guest is Professor Suyu Chen. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about her. Um, so Professor, if you can start with your video so we can see you. Hi, welcome. So she, is, she describes herself as a person that has passion, empathy, courage, and creativity, which she considers are the most important things for an artist and an art educator. She finished her Bachelor of Fine Arts in School of Visual Arts, and now she's going to enroll in the master's of art education program next semester, so good luck. As an art teacher to her, art symbolizes infinite possibilities because art exists <coughs> everywhere in our life. Uh, Professor Chen believes that art should not be limited to media because any creation can be art. So she regards it very important to cultivate in students towards a correct perspective of being honest, receptive, and creative. So we're welcoming you here today in our webinar and please, Go ahead with your talk. Thank you very much. Hello, guys. Thank you all for inviting me to join today's meeting. And uh, I'm going to share my screen. I'm showing you some little presentations. Yeah, so can you see it? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. So um, today I would like to share with you some so about some like my own experience and also some of my recent works on art in science. Uh, like as an art educator, I think art is very helpful in any major, not only about like drawing, painting, sculpture, because I feel art is also about like creativity, imagination, and also observation. And I think these are also the key points of science. So I feel art is very important in science and also science very important in art. Oops. So like there are a lot of artists who also do scientists and also a lot of scientists who are also artists. So firstly, I would like to talk about like the relationship between art and science. And then I will talk about some art elements in science like golden ratio, like schematic diagram. So like there is a famous artist who is Leonard da Vinci, I guess you guys have heard of him. So like um, Da Vinci's his research and notes in anatomy contribute a lot to the like, medical profession. And he, at that time, he dissected corpses and drew muscles, organs, and also bones by himself. His very detailed drawings helped so many medical staffs and artists to know more about like human body. And he also studied a lot about like, animals, plants and his interests also include architecture and engineering. 
like his inventions of um, helicopter um, about accurate clocks and uh, all he did this in this very like different field but it's all coming to art like all he did is to um creating a more accurate drawing but like at the same time on the way of he doing the art uh, he also did a lot of contribution to the science And then like the, the golden ratio is also very like famous and we use it like almost every day because it, it exists in every like beautiful things like even beautiful people. And uh, this is a famous painting, Mona Lisa. And uh, uh, there are many golden ratio in this painting and we don't know if Da Vinci did it on purpose or just a coincidence but it's just a coincidence. So like, I think it's become even more amazing because um, like at his moment, uh, they don't have like golden ratio, but he can create this thing. And, and now like we found this formula to calculate the golden ratio. And we uh, found there are so many golden ratio in his painting. So like this kind of coincidence for me is like amazing. And we also use a lot of our elements in solving some like math problems, physics problems, because like um, for me, like understanding a problem um, is more like, it's easier to understand it with visual like images other than the word just verbally. Sorry. So like this diagram I used every day and uh, I, I guess you can all see these diagrams in your like textbook and also exams. And I feel it can help us to understand the content faster just by visualizing the question. Like we have a magnetic field, loop, uh, flows, geometric shapes, and uh, these all are defined by the schematic diagrams. As the diagram tightly relates to the math behind it, it's very hard to understand the signs without art. Like, just like defining the Da Vinci's work is art or science. And for me, it's also very like hard to define its art or science because for me, it's like both. And I would also like to talk about some of my own experience about art and science. So some of my recent works, like in this work, I finished it during the pandemic because uh, I saw some news about like why animals appeared on the public street uh, due to we uh, stay away from their living area. Like uh, a question just, just came into my mind like were we invading other creatures living space like there is a movie called manufacture landscape and i really, really like that movie that movie is about like the environment and also our living space so i had a deep thought about our civilization process like is our freedom and living rights conflicting with the mother nature um are we invading the other creatures living space as we like uh, making our life better and trying to find a more um, comfortable living area for ourselves? So I made this installation about the environmental issues. I glued shells, crab shells, fish bones, and also fishing nets into the artificial lake I made. So this is to stimulate how we catch white marine animal and lock them into glass walls for us to visit. We have so many aquariums in our life and it's very great for education and also like for even vacation for people to join the beauty, enjoying the beauty of the aquarium and can also get some knowledge at the same time. But like how to balance the quality of our life and the quality of other creatures' life is a problem to, uh, for us to solve. And if you study environmental science, you will find out. 
And uh, yeah, this, is, this installation is like to um, create awareness for us to um, pay attention to these problems. This is another installation in this series. So it represents the artificial nature in our life. Like you, uh, like we destroy so many natural hills and we um, build some artificial hills. So like I folded the canvas into the shape I wanted and I painted it into black and white color, which are two human-like colors because absolute black and absolute white don't exist in the nature. And uh, this color, we just made it. And so I want to stimulate the process of building artificial nature like rock creek and aquarium. And then I want to um, show the audience like the damage we cause. And like, I want the audience to think about like how we can do to change this situation. And uh, yeah. Um, yeah, this is another piece I did. The title is Storm. So um, this piece is about storm. And uh, you can see like each little bottle is an uh, individual world. And uh, you, there are little particles inside it. It's like the, the, the flow of the wind during the storm. I feel like weather is very like, magic and uh, like beautiful because it's random, but it also orderly. It follows kind, some kind of rules and that's like everything in the nature is related to art because I feel like anything creative and beautiful is art. So it's not only about like drawing painting and you can see this one is like some little uh, experiment that I did in the bottle. And then this uh, course that I really liked and I took this year is bio art. So like, um, unfortunately we are not able to go to the lab this semester, but like in the past we can go to the lab and do the experiment by ourselves. And bio art is a very interesting course and I really liked it. This year, like um, we only paint some, um, photos like bacteria pictures and uh, we do like creation based on that like we do some bacterial paintings and we uh, looked at some pictures that previous students took in our lab and uh, there are so many artistic elements in biology and uh, that's we are looking for as an artist um, we do artwork based on that and we like just show the beauty of that to the audience. So like, uh, hopefully I can go to the lab next semester because I really like to do the experiment in person. And like, this is the environment in our lab. And uh, um, I always feel like it's very, it's very interesting for being just being in the lab, like we are like the real scientists, like we cannot define ourselves as an artist or scientist at that time, because I feel like we are both. And uh, that's all for my today's presentation. And uh, thank you all for your time and if you have any question, you I will be very happy to answer that after that. Thank you very much to you. Uh, it was a really uh, visual presentation. I think there are some questions that have been uh, that there are in the question and answers part. So this would be all of our panelists that are are scheduled for today. We would like to have just uh, uh, if all of the panelists could turn on their cameras. We would like to have a small, a small screenshot.
So of all the presentations, Professor, it was nice to see you now. <laughs> Thank you very much. So Annabelle, if you can turn on your camera too, it would be great. I think. Thank you. So thank you very much for all your presentations. They have been delighted. Everyone in the chat is like completely happy to see all these illustrations and are very thankful for the answers that you have provided in the question and answer section. So just to finalize, if each of you could comment briefly about the questions that you have received and what would be like your closing remarks in regards to the topic. So if we can start with Professor Iwasa, thank you. Um, yeah, I guess I answered a bunch of questions about like the technique and process, which, you know, I didn't really get into in my talk. Um, but yeah, animation, you know, the way I learned it was really just taking classes like regular, you know, not science classes or anything, but like art media arts classes. Um, and so if people are interested in learning um, animation, I think, you know, that right now that's really the way to go is, is there aren't really many specifically software or techniques that are specific to uh, molecular or medical animation. Um, so it's really just a matter of like learning, you know, the software on like YouTube or like <laughs> or whatever, uh, and then applying it towards uh, whatever, um, you know, topic you like. So, so yeah, that's an, and one, one place I like to go for video tutorials, uh, I like lynda.com, L-Y-N-D-A. Um, and so that, that's a subscription service, but um, you can get uh, access to it often through universities and schools. And like, I can get access to it through my public library for free, for free. So it's, it's worth checking out and you can learn, you know, Illustrator, uh, a lot of, a lot of different software using that. So, yeah. Thank you very much, Professor Iwasa. Annabelle, if you can comment on some of the questions and your final remarks, please. Yes, uh, so some of the questions were, um, how did uh, Opuntia Visual started and what are some of like the challenges of illustrating concepts? So, um, and then I have a new question here about software for digital illustration. So I'm going to answer that one first because it's the fastest. So uh, I modify a lot of my illustrations. All of them, I do it by hand. I like to be a little traditional since on my day job, I spend all day in the computer. I like to move along with the pen and paper, but actually um, procreate for the iPad, it's, it's magical. You can actually feel like you have a notebook and you can edit. So that's great for illustrations and it's compatible with, uh, you can export it in layers for Photoshop to do, even for like other projects that are not necessarily just for scientific communication, it's great. Um, so I actually started the uh, Opuntia Visual just as something, uh, as I was mentioning, to uh, bring a little bit together of culture, with science or trying to see how there's a lot of things uh, cultural and maybe I'm really biased because I, I, I miss home, I miss Mexico and I like to sort of like share part of that culture. But then on those things, you can actually always put a little bit of science. Like if we're talking about chocolate and how it was like from the, Ast uh, well, before the Aztecs, the Mayans and the Olmecs, you can bring a little bit of culture. But then on the other hand, you can talk about what is um, the crystals that form in the chocolate when you see all those like blooming things that when you think a chocolate is now gone bad, but it's not, it's just the fat that got something to that. So joining this and I decided to do this in English and Spanish. This is something I do on my free time. Um, and I've been just trying to grow it and I'm hopefully one day I can make this into a printed version. I'm still a little bit old fashioned and I would like, uh, there's, there's a lot of uh, things that I've been learning about printmaking and everybody says print isn't dead. So we will like, I would like to move forward in uh, that direction. And just to close one thing of what is the most challenging. I think sometimes I wanna cover so many things and it's really hard for me to decide what should I include? What should I say? Uh, sometimes to uh, get a punchline, you don't need to explain all the details because you can lose uh, people or people's attention. So you have to, uh, especially when it's static, right? You, you need to have a, so something that it impacts and gets the attention and then just uh, get to the main point. If people are more interested, I always put links to uh, papers or something if they want to get more, but you have to uh, learn a little bit of that less is more. And then the next part is the design. 
how can you make it visually attractive so everybody can uh, can be interested even if they didn't think they like science so that's sort of like the way I've taken. Um, there was something about a career in scientific illustration opportunities. I think a great example is Dr. Iwas. I just do this for fun. Uh, my day job is in science. Um, it would be nice to have something else, but right now I'm just doing it for volunteering. I, if I sell prints or something, which I've done in the past, I do it to help. Um, uh, just like uh, institutions that need to get fundraising and something like that. So that's what I've been doing so far. But uh, I thank you, everybody. You guys have great questions. Thank you very much, Annabelle. Now we're going to Suji Chen. We have some questions for you in the chat. So one of them is like uh, the Club Six members that are working with neurogenesis. They want to know, and they're talking about art and neurogenesis. So they are trying to know if how do you think both are connected and how practicing one can help the other area? Yeah, so um, thank you for the question. Uh, the, like the connection between art and science goes further and uh, discuss about art and neuron. Yeah. Uh, so we had a course that's very interesting, which is about our brains and also about like the neural system in our brain. And I found that it's very uh, interesting course. And uh, um, yeah, like I feel like art is like not, uh, you, you don't use this to solve the scientist question, but like the way of when you use art is a way of finding creativity and imagination and that will help. And I feel like the similarity between these two subjects, it's like the how you begin the subject. Like uh, in my education area, I focused on like younger age uh, students, which is maybe K to six or even K to 10. And uh, I feel like art is also very helpful for them to express their like opinions better, like to make them uh, feel they are hurt by people. And uh, yeah, like I feel like expressing emotion is also very important for scientist students because I know like math students or physics students, they are all like living under the pressure of exams, tests. And I feel like art can be a hobby for them to um, distress better. So yeah. And um, I saw a question is, um, is your bio art occurs? You also made your own pictures. And to you, how long does it take to prepare an art exhibition? And um, so, yeah, thank you for the question. Like for preparing an art exhibition, we need to do like a lot of preparation. And like, uh, if we are going to exhibiting our works, like most and most time is not only exhibiting one person so it's like most time it's a group uh, exhibition like we if it's a specific topic we will invite many different scientists uh, artists I mean artists to show their artworks in that exhibition because like uh, artists don't do one topic like do a lot of focused on one topic so they like we do a lot of things and uh, if we're gonna to do like a personal exhibition it takes at least like three years for preparing for it thank you very much to you and all of the comments are going in regards to thanking you the three panelists showing to all the assistants how you can do art and science together and how can powerful tool can be in order to make science divulgation and in order to finalize, so to, to end, the everyone's just like, please, can you post your social media in order that we can see your scientific art and we can follow you? So maybe you can do that in the in the general chat if you would like. Uh, and so everyone can follow you. They're very interested in seeing more of your illustrations. So thank you very much for including that information in the chat. So this is one last question. 
from Mexico, Carlos Rojas, and he says, uh, can you recommend some tips of doing scientific illustration or involving your scientific work with art? If anyone would like to answer that, please. Um, yeah. I would say like take more pictures when you do scientists, like when you do science, like when you do um, experiment or just uh, when you like solve some problems and just leave that all the notes and uh, maybe take more pictures. And maybe like a week later, you will find, oh, there are something more about it. Like when you review your pictures or notes, you will find more than what you did. Okay, so thank you very much once again. This is pretty much what we had for you, all of us, our assistance in this seminar in art in scientific research and education. I wanna thank you, uh, Dr. Janet Iwasa, Dr. Anabel Romero Hernandez, Yu Chen, for your time, for the presentation that you've given and how you uh, opened up the minds of everyone in order to scientific illustration. So thank you very much. And for our students, volunteers, we uh, welcome you for other webinars we're gonna have as part of Science Club activities. So thank you very much for your presence and your time. We look forward to seeing you in the near future. So have a good afternoon. Thank you, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye.